Okay, so good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the UCT virtual academic seminars. Um, my name is Matthew White, and I'm a registrar here at the University of Cape Town. And uh, this morning, I'll be presenting on granular meningitis. Um, the reason I chose this not so exciting and uncommon topic for a seminar is that I feel it's one of those otological conditions that uh, we infrequently see, um, probably frequently miss completely or misdiagnose, and when we do diagnose, in fact, we are usually unsure how to treat it. So just a brief disclaimer, I've written consent from the patients to publicly share their clinical details on this platform and all my content is referenced. Um, just to run through a case example, um, Miss J.S. is a 46-year-old female. She has no known comorbidities. She presented to our clinic with a two-year history of recurrent mucopurulent arteria with associated oral fullness and pruritus. Specifically, she had no associated hearing loss, otalgia, or any previous otological interventions. She had been treated exhaustively by the referring GP with multiple courses of systemic antibiotics, steroids, Various and various autotopicals with no sustained improvement. Systemic and EMT exam was unremarkable, apart from otoscopy performed, which real revealed the following. So there was significant arteria and pus, which was microsuctioned, um, ultimately revealing the above tympanic membrane. And a diagnosis of granular meningitis was made. So the question was what to do next. So hopefully I'll answer that with the case with the seminar today. Um, I'll be covering several aspects of granular meningitis. Specifically, I'll cover the definitions, the etiology, the epidemiology, the clinical presentation, the relevant special investigations, and the different modalities of management and, and look at the evidence. So just a few definitions to avoid any confusion. Um, the term meningitis in isolation is used to denote an inflammatory condition of the tympanic membrane involving its lateral surface with or without the involvement of the adjacent bony external artery canal. It can be subclassified into acute or chronic on the basis of duration of the symptomatology or further by the underlying pathogen or cause into viral, bacterial, or fungal, as well as eczematous meningitis, which occurs as part of one of the systemic manifestations of atopic eczema. Additional subtypes include granular and bullous meningitis. Bullous uh, meningitis is also known as hemorrhagic meningitis and is a form of uh, or a subtype of acute meningitis, which may be caused by bacterial infection, typically strep or staph or viral infections such as run-of-the-mill uh, influenza or even um, herpes zoster and can be uh, within the spectrum of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome. Um, bullous meningitis can manifest as an isolated meningitis affecting the tympanic membrane only, or it can occur together with middle ear infection as part of the spectrum of acute otitis media. It classically peaks in children between the age of six months to 12 years and presents with these classic bullo or vesicles on the tympanic membrane, which form between the outer epithelial layer and the middle lamina propria of the tympanic membrane. They may occur as a single vesicle, like in the top image, or as multiple image, uh, sorry, multiple vesicles as in the bottom image. Granular meningitis uh, specifically is defined by our prescribed textbook, Scott Brown, as a chronic inflammatory disorder characterized by de-epithelialization of the outer squamous layer of the tympanic membrane and replacement with granulation tissue, all in the absence of middle ear disease. So the majority of definitions agree with Scott Brown. Um, specifically requiring an absence or the exclusion of middle ear disease or inflammation. Um, as I mentioned, it's a chronic inflammatory disorder requiring that the duration be present for more than one to three months. 
Other synonyms include chronic meningitis, meningitis granulosa, granulomatous meningitis, granulating meningitis, and granular external otitis. And just to clarify, it most certainly does not include all forms of granulation tissue or polypoidal tissue found in the ear, and it must fit the above definition. Um, as we know, granulation tissue, like in any other areas of the body, can be secondary to multiple other inflammatory or malignant causes like cholesteatoma, benign neoplasms or malignant neoplasms, and tuberculosis or other granulomatous conditions. Um, from a histopathological point of view, um, as you'll remember, the past tense are part of the tympanic membrane. Uh, consists of three layers, uh, which are illustrated in the image on the left. A lateral layer made of the squamous epithelium, a middle layer of connective tissue or lamina propria, and an innermost layer of simple cuboidal epithelium. In, in granular meningitis, uh, as illustrated in the cross-sectional uh, image on the right, a non-specific insult to the outer squamous epithelium and lamina propria results in impaired healing and uh, impairment of re-epithelialization with subsequent edematous granulation tissue formation with uh, neocapillary formation and diffuse infiltration of chronic inflammatory cells growing on the lateral surface of an intact tympanic membrane with no covering epithelium. The granulations may be isolated or localized to limited areas of the tympanic membrane or may be diffuse involving the entire tympanic membrane. Um, in terms of the etiology, there's marked uh, heterogeneity in the literature regarding this. Um, the majority acknowledge it as an idiopathic condition, as I mentioned, where no underlying cause is predominantly found. However, multiple risk factors have been postulated in the literature. Um, where the most recognized risk factor is prior autological intervention regarding from something as benign as cleaning by microsuction in the clinic to moringotomy to middle ear and mastoid surgery. Um, here, as I mentioned, it's proposed that the iatrogenic deepithelialization of the superficial layer and injury to the lamina propria triggers the uh, granulation formation. Uh, moringoplasty and tympanoplasty surgery specifically carry a particularly high rate of post-operative granular meningitis at 5.5%, um, with the use of homographs carrying an increased risk at 8%. Um, bacterial and fungal infections have also been implicated in, in many reports. However, their exact role as primary pathogens versus secondary commensals or infections is unknown. Um, most common bacterial isolates include um, both methicillin sensitive and resistant Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, and less commonly, uh, Coronia bacterium, Proteus, and fungal species like Candida. Um, in, in the top image on the right, we, we see an example of fungal granular meningitis, which is uh, made evident by the typical kind of white fungal elements or with newspaper type appearance. Um, in addition, historically, the literature suggested the following possible causes with little in the way of supporting evidence, uh, local irritants, poor oral hygiene, such as uh, soft uh, ear cleaning with cotton buds and habitual scratching, uh, foreign bodies have been implicated, high ambient temperatures, as well as swimming. As I mentioned earlier, um, granular meningitis is by definition idiopathic and, and occurs in the absence of middle ear disease or systemic ear disease. Um, but more recently, Banzal challenged, challenged this and attempted to reclassify it into primary and secondary forms essentially where the primary form refers to the idiopathic disease and the secondary form refers to granulation tissue on the tympanic membrane, secondary to other causes, um, the, all the different causes you can see in the uh, documented there. Um, however, this classification and approach is far from universal acceptance and most expert autologists still regard it as an isolated idiopathic entity. 
um, which in my opinion, in a way seems slightly contradictory as one of the principal causes or perhaps maybe a risk factor is, is previous otological surgery. So would not fit the true idiopathic definition. Um, in terms of epidemiology, due to the heterogeneity and varying degrees of granular meningitis, it's probably largely underdiagnosed and underreported in medical literature. Um, as you can see by the images, especially the top one, it can be a very subtle otological finding, which may be easily missed. If the tympanic membrane is not properly visualized or cleaned prior to examination. There's a massive discrepancy in terms of its prevalence uh, in the medical literature. Overall, it's considered to be among the rarer diseases of the ears. Historically, it's quoted that major institutes report less than 100 patients over several year periods, with one paper suggesting that it was approximately one tenth as common as all forms of chronic otitis media and one quarter of that of cholesteatoma. Um, however, um, having said that, uh, later in, in 2011, uh, Wolf et al. estimated that 0.41%, so roughly one in 200 of all patients in their clinics had some degree of meningitis. Um, the incidence of granular meningitis is also not related to sex, age, any particular systemic diseases or seasons. So how do they present? So the majority of patients present with persistent or recurrent uh, otorrhea, which may be malodorous. Um, some of the patients can be completely asymptomatic and granulations are seen as an incidental finding on routine otoscopy. Um, other symptoms include uh, kind of intramiatal pruritus or fullness, uh, mild conductive hearing loss, and, and very rarely otalgia. Um, in one study, 70% of patients with granular meningitis had had symptoms for approximately one year or more prior to diagnosis. Um, the diagnosis is confirmed on autoendoscopy or automicroscopy, importantly following meticulous microsuction, uh, which usually reveals granulation tissue on the tympanic membrane with or without involvement of the um, medial external auditory canal. The granulations typically have a sessile base, but may also be of the pedunculated or polypoidal form. They may be localized or segmental, occurring only on part of the tympanic membrane, as in the top image. Or they may be diffuse, occurring on the entire surface of the tympanic membrane, as in the bottom image. The localized form is the most common and most commonly involves the posterior superior quadrant. And classically, as we mentioned, the disease occurs in the absence of middle ear disease. So the tympanic membrane is typically mobile with pneumatic otoscopy. However, may become immobile with subsequent healing with fibrosis and uh, secondary moringosclerosis. Um, by definition, it occurs in an intact tympanic membrane. However, it's now become acknowledged that it may also occur in conjunction with a perforation of the tympanic membrane in some papers. In addition, as I mentioned, as it may occur as a complication of previous otological intervention, it's important to look for features of previous surgery. The application of gentian violet is a, is a useful trick described. Um, as it essentially helps assess the extent of involvement to, uh, um, of the granular meningitis, so which is helpful in directing therapy, as well as potentially assessing response to therapies. Um, what happens is gentian violet, when it's applied, adheres only to areas of epithelial defect, um, leaving the area of the intact tympanic membrane uncoated and therefore unstained. Um, and this allows one to delineate the uninvolved epithelium. As we see in this series of images in image A, one can appreciate the pre-application, the potential areas involved with granular meningitis. In image B, the gentian violet stains the granular meningitis and demarcates it. 
image C, we see the tympanic membrane post laser resurfacing. And in, and in, in image D, we see the tympanic membrane on one month follow up. It's paramount to differentiate uh, granular meningitis from other causes of chronic or arterial polypoidal tissue in the external artery canal and on the tympanic membrane. And it should never be used as a blanket diagnosis. The topic of oral polyps is a topic on its own, um, but as you'll see, many other conditions can present with an oral polyp and uh, similar otoscopic findings. Um, it's important that one should look out for red flags for other more sinister conditions. And importantly, granular meningitis does not cause severe otalgia, headaches, cranial neuropathies or other neurology, systemic symptoms such as cough, loss of weight or night sweats, associated lymphadenopathy or parotid involvement, pulsatile tinnitus does not cause significant conductive hearing loss, moderate or worse conductive hearing loss, or any forms of sensory neural hearing loss or mixed hearing loss. It does not cause any vestibulopathies or disequilibrium or vertigo. So then just an exercise to illustrate my point, um, we can play a little diagnostic game. Um, you can each just run through the series of photos and come up with your own diagnoses in the next few seconds. So I highly doubt any of you were able to get all of these correct, um, kind of illustrating my point that there's a massive differential diagnosis for an oral polyp, which I'll not individually run through. In terms of investigations, uh, granular meningitis is a clinical diagnosis made on uh, microscopy or endoscopy. And very rarely is further investigation required beyond the, beyond the usual routine audiometry. Um, a pus swab may be performed, perhaps not always up front, but rather in atypical or recalcitrant cases. Here, as we mentioned earlier, the most common pathogens encountered are Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. Um, in my opinion, the main utility of a pus swab in our context is to exclude TB and otomycosis, which may mimic the condition. Um, in its use in bacterial MCNS, one must be cognizant of, the, of basing one's treatment on antibiotic bacterial sensitivities based on pus swabs, as the majority of labs base the resistant profile on the minimum inhibitory concentration of which systemic antibiotics will achieve in the serum. And as we know, antibiotic drops will achieve a minimum inhibitory concentration concentration in the ear um, in excess of 100 times that of which is achieved in the plasma when administered systemically. Um, biopsy may really be considered to exclude a temporal bone malignancy or another invasive disease process, which should in most cases be done following imaging. Um, a CT temporal bones is by no means routine, However, again, it can it may be indicated where granular meningitis is really complicated with oral stenosis or atresia, or in the second scenario where there's diagnostic doubt, where one would perform a CT scan to exclude disease processes like cholesteatoma, where one might see the typical erosion of the scutum, ossicular erosion, expansion of the aditus ad antrum, or sclerotic mastoid as indicated in the top image. Or you may even discover rarer entities like a facial neuroma in the bot, as, as in that bottom CT image. Essentially, in granular meningitis, the century, a CT temporal bone should be relatively normal, apart from some minor thickening of the tympanic membrane. Specifically, it does not cause middle ear or mastoid opacification, as I mentioned, any ossicular erosion or any erosive changes within the temporal bone and very infrequently is an MRI required. 
In terms of the natural history and potential complications, um, due to the rarity of the disease and the scarcity of literature, the true natural history is difficult to define. Um, a small percentage is thought to spontaneously resolve without treatment, but the majority of cases, if left untreated, will continue to cause persistent or recurrent symptoms and may subsequently complicate with circumferential thickening with subsequent re-epithelialization and complicate with medial oral atresia or canal stenosis. Various classifications have been described in the literature over the years with none really gaining any particular traction. The two most commonly encountered are those by Wolf described in 2006 and Kim in 2011. Wolf et al. classified it into four grades based on the extent of disease, in which grade one is focal deepithelialization, grade two is focal polypoidal granulation formation, grade three is diffuse polypoid formation of the entire tympanic membrane, and in grade four, granulations also extend to involve the external auditory canal wall. Kim's classification integrates both the location as well as the appearance of lesions. Um, he broadly categorized um, uh, granular meningitis as either marginal or non-marginal, depending on the involvement of the margin of the tympanic membrane. Um, and subsequently, depending on the predominant appearance of the lesion, these lesions are subclassified as polypoidal or ulcerative. In his case series, mo the marginal ulcerative type is the most common variety seen. This is a series of photos taken from Kim's original paper in 2011, which photographically illustrates the subtypes of granular meningitis, as well as documents its response to treatment with Castellani solution over time. The first row or top row designated with an MP illustrates the marginal polypoidal type. The second row, um, the NP, the non-marginal polypoidal type. The third row, the marginal ulcerative type, and the fourth row with the NU, the non-marginal ulcerative type. And as I mentioned, the subsequent columns correlate with the response to treatment over time. So now moving on to management. Um, in terms of the general principles of management, uh, treatment is often more prolonged compared to other types of otitis media and externa and recurrence is common. Uh, regular microscopic cleaning is paramount. Um, it is generally speaking a graduated approach in which therapies with the lowest potential risk to the patient are attempted initially. Um, broad treatment strategies include topical antibiotics, steroids and or antifungal drops, topical antiseptic or caustic agents, uh, debulking of granulations with cold steel or laser ablation and surgical excision with grafting. Um, various autotopical antibiotics have been used with uh, none evaluated against each other in the context of a randomized control trial. As I mentioned in the previous slide, um, the approach is a graduated one and most ENTs will agree that starting with an antibiotic drop with or without a steroid drop is considered first line importantly. <clears throat> in our unit, uh, we would prescribe Silodex drops first line, or when not available, use a combination of, thom of ophthalmic drops used off label, specifically uh, ofloxacin, which is ciprofloxacin uh, based, and Maxidex steroid based eye drops. Um, the correct administration of uh, the eardrops is obviously important. Um, patients should lie down with the affected ear facing upwards and remain in that position for about five minutes after the topical therapy is administered. Uh, water precautions should be advised for 10 to 14 days or until resolution. And patients should be discouraged from cleaning their ears with cotton buds as this can cause further micro trauma. As I mentioned previously, one can be guided by culture and sensitivity results taken from pus swabs. However, one must be cognizant that the um, minimum inhibitory concentration is usually given for plasma and systemic antibiotics and not autotopicals 
and may not truly reflect antimicrobial resistance to uh, antibiotic drops. The treatment is continued for approximately two weeks and uh, the literature proposes that if there is subsequently no improvement and the patient has been compliant with drops, one would consider either diagnostic error or switching to topical caustic agents. However, in our unit, we will often trial a period of topical quadriderm ointment, usually applied under microscopy over the tympanic membrane or alternatively applied to an otowick. Um, for those of you who don't know, quadriderm is a dermatological preparation containing a combination of antifungal, antibiotic, and steroid uh, ointment. Specifically, it com com contains gentamicin, uh, cleoquinol, and tolmaflate, which are both antifungals, and uh, betamethasone. Um, our use of quadriderm is, I suppose, unfortunately not based on any evidence specifically for granular meningitis, but is rather based on its proven efficacy when used in uh, chronic otitis media. And uh, as illustrated in the study performed by Professor Luke, uh, in which quadriderm was found to be effective in 85% of patients who failed initial first-line treatment of chronic otitis media with either acetic acid or ciprofloxacin eardrops. If we move on to the topical antiseptics and caustic agents, um, <clears throat> these are almost universally considered second line or perhaps first line where the previously mentioned uh, antibiotic drops are not available or too expensive. Um, the majority of these agents work through almost direct chemical cautery or through a type of caustic debridement, I suppose, of the granulation tissue, as well as being bactericidal by creating an acidic environment, which is not conducive to bacterial growth. Um, as we may know, bacteria grow based in a pH between 6.5 to 7.5, where, for example, the application of 1% acetic acid drops um, drop the canal pH to approximately 2.5. Um, they are again generally problematic and then they can cause a degree of canal irritation and discomfort, which is particularly problematic in the pediatric cohort. And uh, further, they are autotoxic or their potential to cause autotoxicity is unknown and therefore should not be considered in the presence of a tympanic uh, membrane perforation. Um, some of the agents include uh, acetic acid drops, which is probably the most readily available in South Africa, boric acid, formalin, dilute vinegar, 5-fluorouracil, castellini solution, dilute hydrogen peroxide, silver nitrate, cautery, um, and uh, just to mention that both hydrogen peroxide and silver nitrate cautery despite being relatively effective, were shown by Fundamir in 2010 to carry an increased risk of iatrogenic perforation of the tympanic membrane at 10 and 20% respectively, and, and are therefore um, very rarely used today. So interestingly, a couple of studies have assessed the utility of dilute vinegar in the management of granular meningitis. Um, this is obviously an appealing agent as it's readily available and uh, comes at a low cost in even the most resource constrained environment. Um, it has antimicrobial properties against both bacteria and fungus such as Pseudomonas, Staph, Klebsiella, Cinolitobacter, E. coli, uh, all forms uh, um, of Proteus, Candida, and uh, some forms of Aspergillus. And in the above uh, randomized control pub trial published uh, this year, which compared outcomes of granular meningitis treatment between 1% uh, diluted vinegar drops versus 1% chloramphenicol eardrops. Um, the study included 24 adults. Um, patients were equally randomized either to the 1% diluted vinegar group or 1% chloramphenicol group. The dilute vinegar was a 1% solution, which was mixed by adding one mole of acetic acid to 99 moles of sterile water, and four to six drops of this solution were installed three times a day. 
The results interestingly showed 92% or 11 of 12 patients treated with 1% diluted vinegar had complete recovery. And in the versus the chloramphenicol group where 67% uh, of patients recovered. Um, unfortunately, the difference between groups was not statistically significant. <clears throat> Dizziness and mild external artery canal irritation was observed in 50% of the vinegar group and interestingly at a higher rate of 66% in the chloramphenicol group. But um, in both these groups, the complaints were not sustained and all patients completed their courses of therapy. Um, in addition to this study, a study by Jung et al. in 2002, uh, where 40 moles of 1.2% dilute vinegar was irrigated once to twice daily for a week, they also reported promising outcomes with a recovery rate of 80%. Castellani solution is another agent which is well described in the literature. It again is uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, for those of you who want to know, it comprises of a combination of uh, phenol, resorcinol, basic fuchsin, acetone, 80% ethanol and uh, distilled water. It has uh, similar properties to other caustic agents, but carries the added benefits of, of like um, gentian violet staining the de epithelialized tympanic membrane which is obviously assist diagnostically as well as in directing treatment and assessing response to treatment. Um, despite an animal study showing that it did not damage the hair cells when used um, in the middle ear, there's still a concern of autotoxicity and should be used in an intact tympanic membrane. In this prospective study by Kim et al, 24 patients were treated with Castellani solution. 95% or 23 of the patients showed complete resolution, 14 of which occurred within two months, eight of which required more than three months of treatment. So it therefore requires a comparatively longer duration of treatment compared to the dilute vinegar. Um, no complications were observed. One confounder to the study is that in many of the cases combined treatment modalities were used with the, in conjunction with antibiotics, Castellini solution, as well as local debridement. So this obviously makes it difficult to assess the true response to Castellani solution as opposed to the other interventions used. And the bottom image nicely illustrates the staining and the sequential response to treatment with application of Castellani solution over a seven month period. Um, Local debridement or ablative techniques described in the manager, management of granular meningitis include silver nitrate cautery, um, as well as 50% trichloroacetic acid cautery, uh, which we mentioned earlier, surgical debridement of granulations with cold steel cup forceps, and laser vaporization of granules, sorry, granulations. Um, all of the above interventions are obviously invasive and uh, may be performed under local or general anesthesia. They carry uh, increased risk of perforation. All three modalities may also be combined with the application of steroid or antibiotic drops, either given as drops or soaked on, in gel foam. Um, however, there are no studies to support this practice. Um, despite the first two methods, specifically surgical debridement and silver nitrate cautery being well acknowledged modalities, there were no studies that I could find describing their outcomes. Um, one of the theoretical benefits, I suppose, of cold steel debulking include that it provides a specimen which can subsequently be sent for MCNS either to direct therapy as well as histology to exclude malignancy or an alternative diagnosis. Surprisingly, only two publications exist regarding the use of laser ablation of granular meningitis, the most recent of which is from 2008. Both studies utilize the CO2 laser with a spot size of 0.5 to 1 millimeter and a power setting of 5 to 10 watts used in continuous mode. Um, the two studies use either a handheld or a micro manipulator spot CO2 laser. 
Um, usually gentian violet is used to demarcate the lesions prior. Um, the above study on the left was a 10-year retrospective review of 30 patients with medically recalcitrant uh, meningitis. And in all the cases, uh, CO2 laser ablation was performed under local anesthesia in the outpatient setting. Of the 30 years, 73% demonstrated total resolution, 23% demonstrated partial resolution, and the status of one year remained unchanged at the end of follow-up. Um, revision laser therapy was performed only in 10% of years, where one of the three years um, had total resolution. And uh, the time to total resolution of disease ranged from one to six months with a mean of 2.9 months. Um, no complications are mentioned in this paper. These findings are similar to the earlier study on the right in 2006 conducted by Yang, in which 18 of 21 patients, so an 85%, were cured after a single treatment with, with the laser technique. Importantly, in their study, they mentioned that no perforations were noted, hearing thresholds remained unchanged, and no recurrence was seen over the mean 2.6 year follow up period. Again, this series of images, which I showed previously nicely documents the meningitis on presentation with demarcation of gentian violet, the appearance immediately after laser ablation, and finally the appearance at three months. The final modality is excision of the involved tympanic membrane with under or overlay grafting. So essentially a moringo or tympanoplasty. Any graft materials can be used, including auto and homografts, um, ranging from temporalis fascia, perichondrium, periosteum, cartilage, skin, um, or even xenografts like the uh, biodesign porcine graft can be used to make, just to mention a few. Um, Again, adjuncts described with uh, no evidence to support or refute their use include the application of antibiotic or steroid soap gel foam, which in theory is, is performed to reduce subsequent granulation tissue formation post-op. Post -op. Um, this is obviously the most invasive of the techniques and carries the usual potential complications of tympanoplasty, including obviously failure with subsequent perforation, iatrogenic cholesteatoma, dead ear or profound sensory neural hearing loss, mixed hearing loss, or worsening post-operative conductive loss, tympanosclerosis. And as also, as we know, granular meningitis can, can subsequently occur as a complication of tympanoplasty surgery. And obviously the general complications of the required local general anesthesia. Again, um, there are unfortunately only two studies in the literature regarding these approaches, both of which are relatively old. So starting with the oldest and most frequently quoted study, uh, which was published in 2000, um, essentially in this practice, uh, the unit uh, used a combination of acetic acid, steroid and antibiotic drops as first line for a period of 10 days with micro cleaning every two to three days. If, there's no, if there was no response, then Cautry with 50% trichloroacetic acid was used, as well as a systemic course of fluoroquinolones was trialed. If this failed, after, observa after observation period of a few months, patients were then offered surgery. In the study, 48 patients were managed surgically. Um, the surgery was tailored according to the extent of disease into two groups. In the first group, um, in the focal segmental forms, the entire granular area of the drum was excised with the adjacent meatal skin if it was involved. And the area was grafted by an underlay cartilage perichondrial autograft taken from the tragus, as illustrated in the drawings from his original paper. 
in the diffuse form, the approach was to thoroughly curate all the granulations until the lamina propria was totally denuded and smooth. The denuded area is then supported by an underlay of cartilage perichondrium graft, and the surface is covered by a very small, thin um, series of tierce grafts taken from the upper arm as a type of an overlay. Um, the canal was left packed for 10 to 15 days. Um, complete healing is said to occur by three weeks. And uh, the cartilage is theoretically used to guard against future retraction pocket formation. For those uh, unfamiliar with the term Tiersch graft, it is essentially a partial thickness, semi-transparent skin graft taken freehand or by dermatome. In terms of the results of the patients treated surgically in the study, um, 36 were treated by the segmental approach with no recurrence on follow-up, ranging from six months to 12 years, with only one perforation reported. Eight had focal disease and were treated by the same segmental approach with um, one recurrence at two months. Four had the diffuse disease and had the diffuse approach with only one recurrence at 10 months. So this ultimately equates to a combined overall recurrence rate of 4.1% and a perforation rate at 1%. The second study was a retrospective study of 21 cases of medically recalcitrant granular meningitis, all of the diffuse subtype. Um, the study was published in 2010. All patients were managed surgically by the following technique, um, as illustrated in the original papers, interoperative photos and post-operative photos at three months at the bottom there. Um, the procedures were performed all under general anesthetic by a retroauricular approach. Um, in this technique, a flap is elevated between the fibrous layer and the superficial layer of the tympanic membrane. The superficial granulation tissue is then peeled off the lamina propria, almost on block with this entire superficial layer of the tympanic membrane. Um, a piece of temporalis fascia um, harvested slightly larger than the tympanic membrane um, is then placed over the residual fibrous layer in an overlay technique. This is then supported laterally by a layer of silastic sheet and gel foam soaked in steroid ointment. At three months postoperatively, all patients' tympanic membranes had returned to normal and their air bone gaps were less than 10 decibels on average. Um, there was no recurrence after two to five years of follow up. So then finally, if we look at the current evidence in totality, comparing the different modalities, um, the above systematic review published recently in 2018 is about as close as one gets. Um, in this uh, systematic review of 18 studies, um, the significant ones we've already reviewed individually, um, the breakdown was uh, five studies on topical agents, three studies of laser assisted treatment, and a total of two studies on surgical treatment. Um, the remainder of the studies um, were regarding other aspects of granular meningitis. Um, the overall resolution rate of topical agents combined ranged from 64 to 100%, uh, laser assisted therapy from 20 to 86%, and surgical techniques at 96 to 100%. This table is a summary of their findings. Um, we have highlighted the modality used together with the respective resolution rate. Um, <clears throat> just to note that again, in terms of topical drops, the best results were achieved with the vinegar solution. Um, unfortunately, there were no studies included which looked at the more commonly used first line antibiotic, antifungal and steroid drops. The Final conclusion by the authors was that um, no well-designed randomized studies exist to assess optimal treatment, and that essentially despite surgery showing superior outcomes, proper patient selection is needed, and the authors emphasize the need for improved further studies to improve our understanding and management of this condition. 
So based on the limited evidence and potential resources and topical agents we have available here at Critiscare, um, I've proposed the following algorithm, which uh, should obviously be adjusted to your resources and tailored to your specific patient. Um, first line for all patients uh, would possibly include microsuction and oral toilet. One should address, as I mentioned earlier, any underlying precipitants like trauma, poor hygiene or, uh, or swimming. Um, a trial of antibiotic and steroid drops. In our context, we, as I mentioned, we'd use Silodex or Ofloxacin and Maxidex drops for a period of two weeks. Um, second line therapy. Um, so if there's no response, uh, one should first confirm compliance and that the correct technique of uh, ear drops has been used. And one should also ask oneself if the diagnosis co is correct and if there's any doubt you may want to investigate um, further by doing imaging or taking a pus swab to exclude TB or otomycosis, or even po po possibly by uh, doing a biopsy. Um, a here is a second line, a trial of quadriderm should be used if, if available for a period of up to two weeks. Um, the, in terms of third line therapy, if there's no response, um, one would consider a trial of acetic acid or dilute vinegar for a further two weeks. And uh, going forward, if there's no response to this treatment, one could consider CO2 laser assisted ablation or resurfacing or um, debridement with cupped forceps. Subsequently, waiting a minimum period of three months to assess response. And uh, finally, as last line, one would uh, offer surgical excision with tympanoplasty. So then finally, in conclusion, um, just to reiterate for one last time, granular meningitis is a rare condition, but is probably frequently missed and underreported. Um, there's limited medical literature on the topic specifically in terms of its etiology and management. And it's definitely an area where future research is needed. Um, and from the limited evidence we have, it seems sensible to adopt a graduated approach in which the modality is stepped up according to response to treatment and tailored to the individual patient. So that ends my presentation for today. Um, so I'm now open to the floor for any comments. Um, I don't know if um, Dr. Harris is available to comment. Thanks, that was a very nice presentation. I think you've um, covered all the important aspects. Just, um, just to reiterate what you said, that um, you know, if there are any red flags, then you have to revisit your diagnosis. Um, I, I'd be very careful of the patient who presented granular myelitis where it extends onto the EAC. And we've had about two of those that have come, or well, once come back as a neuroendocrine tumor that we had to refer, believe it or not, in the ear. And the other one is CC. So uh, in both of those, there were atypical. One was just ex uh, extension onto the EAC from the plant membrane. And the other was the presence of pain. So I think one has to be very cautious. Um, I. Usually, I'm, I'm fairly conservative. I've been too scared to use anything other than the quadriderm and the antibiotic and steroid drops. Um, and usually, we see these as a secondary for a uh, granular myocarditis case after tympanoplasty. And it's because there's not enough epithelium to close that for that defect to heal, and so it heals by granulation tissue. And there, I have used a fierce drop, and the fierce drop usually works quite well, but it is a problem in that some patients do whatever you do just comes back. In terms of the secondary granular myelitis, I've not had any experience with the laser or CT acid. I'm not sure if SD's has uh, got anything to add. Um, I've not used laser with that particularly. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Harris. Um, uh, Dr. Mayer, would you like to comment? Um, may be surprised that nothing has really changed. So when we did the talk 20 years ago, nothing has really changed. I think what is very important, you must just explain to the patients what's going on, because they kind of get restrained 
So you kind of just must explain to them it's going to be a long term thing and you need to see them regularly. Um, I must say, I do use hydrogen peroxide that moves it. Um, it's a, it kind of takes the smell away. It, it's more um, for symptomatic, it doesn't always work, but it, it kind of just takes the smell away from the patient. But I think it's still one of those things, it's a pain for everybody involved, the patient and the doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayer. Sorry, and Professor Sagan. And could we ask Professor Tita what they do in the speech today? Uh, Professor Sidat, would you like to comment? Uh, I think you're currently muted. Uh, I think we follow very much the same approach. I've also never used the uh, laser for, for, my, uh, for my inductors. Man, it just struck me, you know, we do tend to function in silos, and the question is, uh, should we be speaking to the dermatologists and see whether they perhaps have, have a different or they might have a different approach because we are dealing with the skin line uh, um, surface? Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Fagan. I think that's definitely something to consider. Um, uh, I, 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 I don't see any uh, further comments on the chat. Um, so I, I think, I guess that's where we'll end uh, today. Uh, thank you everyone for, for attending this morning. And uh, just a reminder, there'll be no um, academic presentation on Friday morning. Instead, it, uh, we'll have the usual um, evening presentation from the African Head and Neck Society. So thanks again and uh, hope everyone has a, a wonderful Wednesday.